Uh, yeah, what do you, what do you think about the altitude uh, about altitude training and and what what actually did you um, yeah think about it if it's beneficial uh, in yeah in what terms and it's a very hot topic in science in exercise physiology the interest in altitude uh, training is still continuing and and we're not really sure we're actually perhaps today less sure about altitude training than we were say 10 years ago because of all kinds of recent uh, advances um, a, a very um, fashionable, fashionable has been for a couple of years uh, the so-called um, living high training low paradigm um, the principle behind that was that if, if former endurance type of athletes would go to altitude and train and live at altitude the observation was that being at high altitude leads to a reduction in the intensity of training because of less oxygen you can train less hard mm -hmm. therefore you would you would be um, submitted to a, a, a reduction of the use of your your, of your body with potentially um, uh, less training effect as you would have had if you would had trained at a higher intensity at low altitude but at the same time you would of course benefit of the effects of high altitude that potentially increase uh, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood because of increased red cell um, uh, synthesis. Um, now because of that this new paradigm was invented by uh, Ben Levine uh, from, from Dallas in the States, a colleague, who said well if now the athletes would just sleep at high altitude and then go down and train very hard at low altitude they would have the benefit of increased red cell synthesis because of sleeping and living at high altitude and the added benefit of high training intensity because of training in normoxic low altitude conditions and that's been used now for for some time but in the end if you if you take everything together the 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 real benefit of it uh, quantitatively is pretty limited it's the, the science is not very strong i mean we we uh, we scientists we we work with evidence. We want to be absolutely sure. If we, if we measure a difference, we want to make sure that it's a real difference. And therefore, you make many observations and do statistical tests and things like that. And if you take everything together, it's not that clear anymore. And we're not sure. And now they make the distinction, for example, Ben Levine has now um, found a way of making a distinction between responders and non-responders. And a responder would somebody with be somebody with a relatively low hematocrit, which and you would see an increase in the hematocrit, and it has to do a little bit with the way people breathe at high altitude. And they have non-responders; they just go to altitude, nothing happens. And there's actually no changes in performance. But it it leaves us a bit um, a bit uh, puzzled and 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 not really satisfied with the answers. Now to make things even more complicated is that uh, you're well aware that there is real altitude and simulated altitude and we first thought it was great, I mean simulated altitude, wonderful, finally people that are not living in a country like Switzerland for, for instance in Holland or so where there's no mountains they can do altitude training just by lying in a tent or sitting in a tent or biking in a tent where we artificially reduce the amount of oxygen in the, in the air uh, you can do that with apparatus and it's not very expensive, 10,000 bucks and you've got a very nice uh, tent you can sleep in overnight and, uh, and, and sleep at 2,500 meters and profit from the effect of lack of oxygen while not being exposed to real altitude. Now, the problem is that we're now realizing that it's not the same as being at high altitude. There's something that has to do with the pressure that probably also plays a role. And um, collectively, it seems as if altitude, real altitude exposure is a bit better than just exposure to lack of oxygen. Now, given everything, um, taken everything together, my point of view today is that if you're an endurance athlete, triathlon or biking or marathon runner, every, everything that goes into, into, uh, into, into long-term aerobic exercise, it makes sense to do some type of altitude training, planning it uh, sufficiently uh, well, like um, three, four weeks prior to a, a major competition, not closer, not further, and um, and uh, keep it to 2,500, 3,000 meters. Don't go higher. 3,200, 3,500 certainly is too high, um, but between 2,500 and 3,000 probably is the proper altitude. 
and try to find ways of combining the real altitude exposure with training at high altitude but also training at low altitude. Th that is my point of view. Uh, why, why do I come with this recommendation? Well, it's, it's taking everything that I've seen and read that has been published in the scientific li literature together. The, it, it's a bit fuzzy. It's a bit soft. I would have loved to make a more clear recommendation saying, well, this research clearly showed that this is the recipe. The problem is the science is not there, training. They brought people to Prémanon. You probably know the center in France where you, they have an altitude house. Mm -hmm. Cyclists, very high level cyclists from all over Europe, competitive cyclists with, with very good levels, and they tricked them. They, they did change a little bit the things in the room, but they wouldn't tell. So they didn't, didn't know whether they were sleeping at altitude or not sleeping at altitude. And they compared the results. There was no difference. There was no difference. This paper just came out and it really sheds major doubt on the whole paradigm of, uh, of simulated altitude uh, with regard to uh, endurance performance. It, it, it's, it's shaking the whole scientific uh, community right now. Big discussions and letters are going to and fro and you did this wrong and you did this wrong. Whatever, sure, we're never sure. Remember, science is also about uncertainty. It's, it's always probing again, asking the question again, and then looking at it from another perspective. And here again, I mean, we're not absolutely sure. Yeah, my other question is I go pretty often, once a year, <laughs> not often, but once a year, so that's often. Uh, I go to altitude, but I'm, I'm not a fan of sleeping high and going, like in San Moritz, for example, it's between 1, 7 and 2. Yeah. And then I ride in the Alps, and uh, yeah, for me sleeping high and then coming down is too much, too much stress. But uh, do you think there is also a, um, an effect? For example, if you if I ride up a pass, a, a long mountain, 15k. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, definitely. You feel it. For, I feel it for briefing, yeah. and then when I go down to um, to thousand meters altitude, maybe it's just placebo, or I don't know, or my feeling. But I feel I. I can breathe better, I feel stronger, because it's very hard training in the altitude. The training itself makes you more efficient, it's always how I felt. The, the, those are all kinds of things that we haven't looked at uh, in sufficient detail yet, the scientists, but they're plausible hypothesis, and I'll explain you one that may be a potential explanation of your observations on yourself. Um, one of the things that happens when you go into altitude and, uh, and do exercise is that the body tries to compensate for the lack of oxygen in the air that you breathe. And there is um, essentially two mechanisms that the body can use to, to, uh, to compensate. And, and one of them is to breathe harder. And why do you breathe harder? It's just to refresh the air um, in the lungs at a higher rate so that the, the oxygen pressure in the lungs is, is a little higher as if you would have breathed normally. Now, if you breathe harder, uh, it means that you train your respiratory muscles. And, and they're very relevant. Um, uh, you may have heard uh, from uh, things like the uh, Spiro Tiger, which is a specific device which, which you can train your respiratory muscles. And there are some interesting effects that have been uh, reached with that specifically endurance type uh, of exercise. Well, altitude training and riding hard up a mountain pass uh, has a similar effect. You're, you're training your respiratory muscles uh, at, a, at, a, at a greater rate as you would do with a similar effort uh, at low altitude. And it's been shown also that people that, have, for example, spent uh, like one or two months in the Himalaya and then they come back, that their sensation of breathing, their, their perception of the, of the difficulty of breathing during exercise is actually lower after a prolonged period at high altitude as compared to before leaving. So yes, makes perfectly sense. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we haven't checked that formally in, in a rigid, scientific, mm. solid way. So the evidence base on which we can say this is the way it is, is lacking. Uh, I'm speculating, yeah. uh, and it's based on reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, reasoning, but I I'm not sure. Yeah, interesting. But can it harm? Can it turn against you? Or is there any evidence? Or that there are individuals who should stay away from these. Well, well, well one of the very training? big problems of certainly in triathlon is um, 
the secret of training for a triathlon is to be able to doze in such a way that you're on the edge, but not over it. Mm -hmm. If anything can go really wrong in, in a type of sports like, like triathlon, it's, it's overtraining. And what is overtraining? What is training? That's first something to, to, uh, to explain. Uh, training is stressing your system in such a way that it's being slightly broken, just enough to have repair mechanisms kick in so that the next time the substrate is able to cope with the same stress without breaking. That, that's the whole principle of training and improving your performance. The problem is, is that there is a limit to that. You, you can't just add training and training and training and training. We just can't cope with that. The, our machinery, our physiology is just not made for that. Um, so, to, so the trick is to be able to look for the level that the system can just cope with in such a way that the return on the investment is the biggest. So it's really approaching the edge. And, 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 the, and the real difficulty of somebody who trains for such tremendous endurance performance like triathlon is knowing where the edge is, staying away from it, but getting really close. I, I think that's totally, that's what my whole sportive career I'm thinking yeah. every day. And listening to your body. I, I've talked to so many champions like Chris McCormick, all the successful guys, they, they of course train hard, but what they, what they do, they know when to rest. And I think it's, especially for endurance athletes, it's, so, it's like you said, it's, it's, the har it's the hardest thing to decide when to, when to, to rest stop. and how much. Yeah. Uh, because in our society, it's more, more said like more is better, mm -hmm. harder is better. Um, but actually you only get tired in training and then in the recovery, you actually, yeah. well, you recover and get stronger. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a big... Yeah, that's something what I have lots of discussion with young athletes now because I'm a little older and I did my mistakes as well. So um, yeah, I can totally feel.